Um, sorry. <laughs> um, to start, whoops, wrong button. We want to thank Wrangle, our premier sponsor, for uh, hosting this event. Uh, pizza, location, drinks, the work. So a big uh, shout out to uh, Wrangle. And Wrangle, we have Myron here who's going to speak for a few seconds on behalf of Wrangle. Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, just wanted to just uh, put a personal touch on how honored we are to have you here with us today. Uh, we support uh, the Agile community in Canada and abroad. We think that it is an amazing opportunity tonight, uh, as with every month we have these, uh, we sponsor these meetups to uh, just have a place for people to learn, grow together, because uh, I think when we learn together, we can accomplish amazing things. Uh, and so I want to just really underscore how uh, much we welcome you for being here. Uh, and I just want to give a shout out to some friends that I met last Friday uh, who are newcomers to Canada. And I want you to welcome them to the community as well. So welcome, newcomers. Welcome, everyone in the Agile community. And thank you for spending your time with Rangel this evening. So if you could, um, do us a favor, if you're on LinkedIn or on Twitter, uh, just tweet out, take a picture, and talk about something you learned today, just the experience, uh, and uh, you know, use the hashtag LearnWithWrangle, and thank you. Thanks, Myron. All right, so um, a few announcements before we get going with our esteemed guests tonight. Um, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, there's our link. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Agile TO underscore CA. And um, Agile Drinks, our next announcement, the next event that I know of is Agile Drinks on December 5th, 2019. For those of you that don't know, um, Agile Drinks is the sibling of Agile TO, and that's our networking, um, because this is all learning and sessions, and we have a, a networking session and it's typically held at Grace O'Malley's every other month. So Agile TO one month, Agile Drinks the next. So please join us um, because it's the end of the year. It'll be our last event for this year. So we have to go out with a big bang. Um, now, at this time, we also invite anyone else. If you have any announcement, you're more announcements to make, you're more than welcome to come up and share with the community. Oh, we have one here. Um. Uh, I'm Fahad, I'm uh, at McKinsey Investments, half a pizza bite in my mouth. Um, we're looking for Scrum Masters, so if you are someone that is comfortable or has thrived in an environment where we're in very early stages of transformation, some of you may know, uh, uh, we're looking for Scrum Masters that can thrive and help change, be changing this in that environment. Um, hit me up uh, on LinkedIn, uh, Fahad Khan, F-A-H-D-K-H-A-N, or just... Uh, right after the, the talk today, please uh, tap on my shoulder. I'm happy to chat. Thank you. OK, um, before we go again, a little housekeeping. I went to use the bathrooms, and they are now co-ed. They weren't last time I was here. So I was a bit kind of confused, believe it or not. So one of them has urinals, one doesn't. So take your pick. But they are co-ed. Um, and they're just down the hall on the right. Oh, did you want me to mention you? You want to come up and talk about you? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul from the Agile Book Exchange. I have a table set up in the far corner. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of how it works, come by, see a book, buy it, $10. Uh, within 30 days, if you don't like that book, say, hey, Paul, can I get my money back? I'll give you back half your money. No problem. Um, <laughs> Yeah, why y'all got to be like that? Okay. <laughs> so basically, come on by. I uh, swear I would have had a lot more books tonight, but my cart broke halfway here, and I can only carry so much. <laughs> but thanks a lot. Hmm? Oh, uh, agilebookexchange.ca. Oh, Thank you. There you go. Okay. Now, anyone else have any announcements? Want to share? Okay. Um, tonight. Continuous delivery with Artie and Cheesy. So a um, little bit about Artie and Cheesy. Artie, oh, I have Artie here and Cheesy there. But Artie is the president and founder of 
oh shoot, Industrial Logic Canada, and Cheesy is Artie's administrator. <laughs> so Artie's great at giving all the, a lot of credit to uh, Cheesy. But um, anyway, I have some slides, a little bit of information, um, but I'm going to leave it to you guys to uh, kick it off and uh, take it further about all the great, wonderful things that you do. All right, big hand for Artie and his, uh, her administrator, Cheesy. <laughs> Thanks, Trish. <laughs> well, that's true, actually. Uh, <laughs> I get to do a lot of things. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Very nice to see some uh, familiar faces and some new faces. And I hear some of you are here for the first time tonight. So welcome to the community. This is a community thing, so uh, it's great to see everything um, growing. And I think we are also live on the internet, which is cool because this is recorded. So everything we say, everyone hears it. So while Cheesy is deciding what to do. Uh, yes, I'm Ardita, I'm, um, I'm an Agile coach. I've uh, been doing this, um, uh, this helping businesses improve for a long time now. Um, and um, I hired Cheesy because he needed a job. So, <laughs> and uh, he's more on the technical side, right? Well, hold the microphone to your ear. That's fine. <laughs> See, guys don't multitask very well. <laughs> what do you want to say about yourself? Did everybody, did, did, uh, did everybody see my microphone not work? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, Turn it on. Okay. Is there like an on button? See, see, I need Artie. My uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> Who, who saw uh, the, the LinkedIn post today that mentioned something like air piano or something along those lines? I don't, I don't know. No? No? So apparently, uh, so the, the pictures that were in, in the announcement, uh, one of them was from an, a conference that I spoke at last year where my hands were like this. And one of them was from Artie, a conference she spoke at no, uh, this year, I think where her hands were like this, and so somebody, some smarty pants, I don't know who. His name starts with Jeff. Posted uh, that, that we were going to give air piano lessons. So I thought, let, let's start off by uh, posing. Come on, come on, come up here. Let's, let's do the pose, come on, let's do the pose. Get your cameras ready, everybody. Come on, this is a once in a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> what are we playing? In case if you can't tell, we like to have fun. So, so air guitar and air piano. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, there. Can we get serious? Why no. are we here? <laughs> Do we have to? to hear about us. Do we have to? I think so. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> wow, good crowd. So we're going to talk about continuous delivery. And let me, let me just ask, how many people here are, are doing CD, continuous delivery, where you work right now? Yeah, half of you are liars. <laughs> no, you're not liars. You just don't understand what it is. There might be one or two of you that are telling the truth uh, and or understand what it is. Oh, and I understand I don't want to walk that way because it creates feedback. So we get started. Okay, start. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, that, that's about us. us. Yeah. So that's our company. Um, one thing that you probably have heard about Industrial Logic Canada is uh, uh, Modern Agile. Uh, and um, it's our partner. Who's heard of that before? Modern Agile, yes? He's our partner in the US, Josh Kurievsky, that is the um, creator of it. We have some versions of the sticker in English and French, because mm -hmm. it's Canada, right? We have mm -hmm. to be bilingual. Multilingual. And uh, you can come after later and pick some. Mm -hmm. And we believe that Modern Agile kind of represents the first part of the Agile Manifesto, if you haven't heard it, it says we are uncovering better ways. And it's all about pushing ourselves. So what you're going to hear tonight is going to sound kind of shocking, maybe, if you haven't heard these ideas before. But this is all about uncovering better ways. Let's get started. Oh, my time. I'm going to start by telling a couple of stories, okay? Um, and That's uh, what it does when it drinks beer. <laughs> Not those stories. <laughs> uh, so this is a story about a client uh, that, that, that I went to work at. And 
Actually, this story took place before I got there, so I, I can't take credit for this. So I wish I could. No, I'm, I'm glad I can't. So, uh, so this client decided that, that they needed to make a change to the way uh, users would navigate through their system. Now, this was a really large U.S. company. They have every day hundreds of thousands of visitors to their site, so it, it's pretty high volume. And so the way that they went about that is the, the product owner decided, you know, we, we need to change this. So they got together with some designers that kind of came up with an idea um, around what they wanted it to do. And once they had that idea, they got the team together and the team to estimate how big it was, right? Because uh, so they did a real quick estimation. And then beyond that, what... Obviously, you have to estimate so you know that you have the budget, right? Because you got to get money. And then once they had the money ready, they uh, had to wait for a team. Because in the time it took to get the approval, the team that they thought was going to do it was actually working on something else. But Wait but a second. They had a team, actually, that was a team? Or did they have to pool 50% of resources? They had teams. Okay. They had teams. Eventually, they got around to building this thing. And... Uh, and this specific company was, was very, very particular about the way that they roll out software. So they, they have this thing that they every time they make a significant release, they call it the first time user experience. And so in this case, what they did is they went out and they actually shot a video, took some pictures, and it was designed so that the first time a user would come out after they had released this, it would have a, a pop-up or an overlay that would come up and it would say, hey, We've got a change, and it would have some pictures of what the chain was, and you can roll through it. And there's even a link that you can click to watch a video of how it works. So they, they spent a lot of time really trying to make it easy for the users to, uh, to adopt to these changes. And there was this highlighted checkbox down in the bottom, which was to opt in to the change. Okay? So they started rolling it out, and the first day they saw users come out, and the team was really excited. You know, one percent, two, five percent, six percent. You know, more and more users started opting in. Eventually, it got all the way up to nine percent of the users that decided to opt in. Nine percent. The interesting thing was was that from the time that the product owner came up with the idea. It was more than a year before they actually rolled it out. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Who here can relate to that story? Wait, some of the same hands that said that you're doing continuous delivery. Wait a minute, there's a, there's a problem here. <laughs> so, unfortunately, uh, a lot of us can completely relate to that story. So this is your slide. You're supposed to talk now. Oh, I'm, I'm, that's how we communicate. <laughs> so the story that he's talking about there is. By the way, she's my wife. In case you don't know, I'm not not normally. Uh, we're, we're we're married, and so she's not normally rude to me. Well, she actually is, but that's. <laughs> and he loves it. <laughs> and now he has my clicker. That's why I didn't know that I could talk. Mm -hmm. so, we only have one. So what was going on there is the fact that it took a year to learn that only 9% of the clients actually are interested on in that. So uh, a lot of waste, a lot of um, uh, time to learn that 9% of people want that. Yes. So what's going on is that the world around us now is not anymore, doesn't wor work anymore in the same speed. Right? Uh, things change constantly. Things move, uh, people move, clients move, they, they try a product, they move to another one, they're not anymore loyal just because you, you have something and you have a big name. They go where they like to, they go where they, uh, they find value. So things change and what we have is we have these product owners, product managers, that are supposed to now manage all these changes that are coming up. Um, product managers manage, they work with teams, and hopefully with stable teams, so with agile teams, right? And they also get the input from the world. So they are in between the world and the teams, right? And what happens there is, oops, 
there. You and see why I don't trust her with the remotes? Remotes belong to guys. I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> I'm burning him with a laser. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So what is going on is that um, that product manager needs now to understand all the things that are coming from outside. Who's in the world? In the world, it is clients, it is markets, it is business itself, internal business, it's shareholders. They all have a saying into this thing that we call world. It is not an easy job to get all these inputs and to have the business benefits in place to make decisions, to bring to the team something to do. And if we bring these big things and we say, okay, we're gonna do this and then teams take forever, what happens? Things keep changing, so we are behind. No matter how fast, right? So we are behind. So we need to find better ways on how to be on time with our changes, considering that things change. So one of the things that it is often used and has a lot of buzz around is the design thinking, right? It is seen as the solution to solve a lot of things on how to find that best thing to do because we start connecting with a client, we start looking at the human side of things, we find the right problem to solve, and then we go through this uh, cycle. Very often, sometimes, this design thinking is seen as the old way of researching and analyzing, and it takes forever. And it is this part where to go through this, it is the one year that we're talking about. So while design thinking has some really, really good concepts, we need to figure it out how to bring it into this agile way of delivering and make it work for us to learn fast. So what we want to do is we want to get this cycle here, the RDA prototype test, go very quickly to give us feedback on this problem that we thought we defined and we're solving for, and to say, are we really thinking about the right problem? Are we solving the right problem? What are people actually telling us? And then like that, have those quick feedback loops into solving the problem, getting the clients, and uh, growing whatever we want to grow, the business, the company, all of the, the needs that we have, right? The, the world, everything that belongs in the world. Okay? So how many people here have heard of Jeff Patton? How many of you believe he's just a story mapping guy? Yeah, he's not the story map. Yeah, he wrote the book he did. on story mapping, he's but... Uh, let me tell you, Jeff Patton, uh, a lot of the things that ultimately became what we kind of relate to in software development, or at least a software form of, of uh, design thinking, is based on a lot of work that Jeff Patton did about 15, 20 years ago. So I suggest going back and reading it. In 2011, in uh, Salt Lake City, there was the large Agile conference. It was the 10-year anniversary of the Agile Manifesto if you were there, uh, it, it was a great time. Jeff Patton gave us talk there that was pretty amazing. So one of the things he talked about was he had just finished doing about three years work with two different Japanese consumer electronic companies and they did a lot of user research. They would, they would set up these, place, these uh, offices in Manhattan, they would bring people through. The thing that he had just finished working on at that time was portable DVD players. I don't know if you remember those. Uh, so, Some yeah, people yeah. weren't born. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, boomer. Anyway, so um, <laughs> so uh, and, and but the thing about Jeff is he's so smart that at the time that they were doing the testing, he was also testing the testing process. In other words. He was planting questions and planting ideas to really try to understand how effective is the testing that we're doing. So that loop that Artie had in the last slide where she was talking about it, they would plant a lot of questions. And the one that I remember, and, and by the way, his talk is online, you can go find it. But he said, one of the things that we did is we asked people, by the way, uh, what color do you think people might want this, this thing in? And this and is eight, is right? So bright fuchsia. They said, oh, they want, of course they want the fluorescent uh, yellow 
or the lime green or the bright orange because those were the colors of the day. I don't know if you remember the time. I had my leisure suit uh, in those colors. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> and, and, uh, and those were some of the answers that they got. But what happened was is after they would finish taking the test, the people would walk out into this room and they had all of these bins of portable DVDs that they could take one as a gift for participating. And the people that said, oh, they want the bright yellow would pick black. And the people that said uh, they want the fluorescent green would pick gray. In fact, he said almost everybody picked black, gray, or white. And so his premise, the premise of his talk was that the answers that we got were complete BS. What was real, the real test was watching what they pulled out of the bin. Because you see, what they said was highly biased. In fact, his belief and his research showed that what it was was they were projecting what they thought others might want, what they thought others might say. But that the real way to understand what they wanted was to watch what they picked. So what we do usually... Talk. Roof. Yes. <laughs> so what we do usually, we are in this cycle where we make assumptions and we say, well, this is what worked yesterday, maybe a little bit change, and then we predict the future, right? And what happens is we create a perception, we create these things that are roadmaps that know everything we need to do, and then we do some estimations around it for confidence, and then we go ahead and we're like, okay, this is it. In reality, actually, reality works differently. We have many changes to embrace and we learn as we go, right? So that what was yesterday's weather doesn't work anymore today. It doesn't, it's not gonna work even a week from now. So between the reality and the perception, there's a, there's a big gap. The reality is a leading way of working. So we lead by learning. We have these leading indicators that tell us that we are on the right path or we need to make changes. We don't say we're gonna do a lot of things and at the end we're gonna see what's going on. This is the lagging way of working. Which one do you think is better? So quiet. Reality. You know, reality always wins, mm -hmm. no matter what. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking to change that thinking from guessing and perceptions. But I thought this talk was about continuous delivery. What, what, what do you know about the continuous delivery? Because the leading... Oh, there it is. ...helps us. <laughs> and how do we do this leading? Huh, Cheesy? Mm -hmm. How do we do this leading? Learning and delivering in a leading indicator, based on leading indicators. That's right. <laughs> oh, that's it? Oh. Oh, wait. That, oh, you want me to answer the question? I thought so. <laughs> See, I can't, I can't, <laughs> can't take I just want to write code. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to get to the code right away. No. But... That is the continuous delivery that we're talking about. So, so continuous this is what it means to us. So continuous delivery is about moving away from theory and moving away from asking questions and getting to a point where we get our users to tell us what they want by watching what they pick out of the bin. Not asking them what color do you want to have them tell us orange. Watch them walk out to the bin and pick the gray. Yeah. So that, in essence, is what continuous delivery is about. But it's more than that, because if you're worried and fixated about the color, how do you know that color is even important? So, mm -hmm. so we kind of came up with a little definition here. This is our own uh, definition of what we think it is. Part of it's geeky. That would be my part. So for me... And the important part is mine. <laughs> every line of code that we've written goes to production, period. There, uh, so if I'm a developer and I'm writing code, I'm gonna commit that code 15, 20, 30 minutes later maximum, that code is in production. 
and I'm going to do that multiple times a day. So if I've got a, so for me, I'm going to create one to five production deployments a day on a team of five developers. That means we're probably creating 25, 30 production deployments a day. And why do you do that? Well, you tell me why. I don't know. Because we want to learn in production with real customers. We are not throwing ideas. We are not working on opinions. We are not working on gut feelings and on guesses. We are working on what customers are telling us in real life. And that's how we make better products. That's how we're building what they need, what they're willing to pay for. So when those users walked out and picked those DVDs out of the bin, do you think that they were thinking, oh, I'm part of a test? No. They knew they were on a test when they were in there answering the questionnaire or whatever. They knew they were a part of a test. But when they walked out the door and pulled something out of the bin, they were just going along an activity that they needed to do. Mm -hmm. And you see, continuous delivery is really about stopping this idea where I know what my users want. My users want this new navigation system. So I'm going to spend a year and a lot of money delivering it. Instead, it's turning that around and saying, I have no ideas what my users want. Let me find a way to build some hypothesis, execute those hypotheses rapidly with users, and allow them through data to tell me what it is that they want. Let me do this again, okay. because I didn't know you were going to talk so oh, much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, continuous delivery should be driven by business. That's the goal, right? learn from the customers to build better products that give us what we're looking for and needs to be driven by business and this is extremely important i can't find now that want me to run the uh, want me to run nope, the uh, it came no nope. so and it, this is extremely important so the the focus we want to talk about is why do we want that boom extremely important to be I'm playing it over and over. Because very often, when you hear continuous delivery, very often you hear technology. You start hearing technical people, you start hearing DevOps, and nobody is thinking all the way on why. Why are we doing this? Why is continuous delivery uh, good? So we need to start thinking the beginning, the ideation, the core reason why the technology needs to support this. And if business supports this, then we are on the right path. Otherwise, you are just building a good Ferrari that is not going to go anywhere, right? You can build very good pipelines. You can build very fast um, delivery uh, pipelines. But if business is not behind you to use that speed and to get the ex experiments fast, it's useless. Who talks on this? Um, you or me? You, you can talk if you want, I, but I, I, I'd like I was going to do a rock, paper, scissor. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I can't stress how uh, important that last statement that Ardita made is that, that uh, continuous delivery, you probably came here and you thought, oh, geez, he's going to geek out. He might even write some code for us today. Or so. who, who thought that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Chaba had expectations for you to write code. <laughs> Chaba. We'll write code uh, next Monday. You're letting him down. But uh, the truth is, is that the real power comes from this. It comes from building great products. So throughout that, that roadmap that you have, because start running experiments, because you don't know what you're going to be doing two weeks, three weeks, a month from now. So uh, the, the geeky part of this is, oh, this is your slide. Oh, the geeky part of this is that uh, I'm going to get into that. This is yours. Well, I like when you said the smart thing that Ardita said, blah, blah, blah. I always say anyway, that. Anyway, so companies decide um, uh, strategy in the outcome. So how does it start? When we say business owns this, where do we begin? Well, we need to begin with a strategy. And the strategy needs to be decided with a vision, with a long-term vision. You, we're not looking for short terms and just execution. We're looking for where do we want to be? Where, what do we want to be known for? What would market know when they hear our brand, right? So it, it's, it's a bigger thing. And that needs to come from the leaders. That needs to come from, um, uh, uh, you know, 
product, business, leaders, shareholders to believe in it. Now, when we set the strategies, we also don't get into outputs. It's important there the word outcome. We're looking for the results that we are looking for. We're not saying we're gonna be there and we're gonna do that by doing project A, B, C. We say we wanna be there and we want to see our customers changing behaviors. We want to see a different way that they use our uh, products or our uh, services. So we're looking for outcomes that are impact that we make outside. Because outcome now becomes the goal and it gives to the teams the opportunity to be innovative and creative on how to achieve that, on what kind of outputs to create for that. So product and business decide the intent, right? So we start with that. And then we have groups like marketing and product owners and, and teams and UX people and whatever you have in your companies that you require to deliver your products or services that work together. And they define the how. They define the outputs. But they don't define it by just, oh, we need to do X. It's about experimentation. It's about those short things that we do, we test, we get feedback, and then we decide what to do next. So, oh, oh that's okay. So, st start with the strategy, think outcome, think the impact that you're making, decide the intent that you have, and then leave the teams to experiment and find the right how to achieve that. Can I give an example? Sure. Okay. So uh, I'm going to give a real quick example. Uh, this is from a client that I did some work for in, in the U.S. a couple years ago. Um, j just because I want you to see how this kind of falls down. Um, so they were in the investment uh, world, and, and the group that I was working for was a group that primarily focused on people that were either approaching retirement or that were in retirement. And so this was the, uh, the, the, the business was focused on that, okay? And so U.S. law states that if um, you are approaching a certain age and you have investments in a tax-deferred investment, you're required by law to take a certain percentage of it out each year so that Uncle Sam, so that the U.S. government gets their money, their tax money. And if you don't, you get fined. And so the outcome that they decided that they wanted to have was a lot of their customers were getting fined. And whenever they would get fined, they would blame the company, even though it was a federal law, you know, that, that the company had no influence over, so they were getting fined. So the outcome was that we need to reduce the number of fines that our customers are having and make our customers happy. So here's how some of the things that we tried. First of all, some of it was mail because they, we, they were sending mail and not everybody was responding to it. So we started quickly ideating and experimenting there. What happens if we put a picture of a grandmother with her grandchild? What happens if we change the font? What happened if we do, and, and each one had a different phone number or a different URL that they could go to. And we started seeing and understanding what percentage of people would, uh, would uh, respond. If we changed, you know, and put a pretty picture and somebody is smiling, did they get a better response? So they also had a situation where somebody would go to the site if they were approaching those dates, it would pop up and tell them about it. And what they learned is that a large number of people would see that and just cancel it. So how can we quickly ideate around making that more obvious? So we probably ran 30 or 40 different versions of that pop-up, trying to understand what can we do to get people's attention. And then they also knew that people that would actually go to say, okay, a large number of people wouldn't actually complete the process, or those that did, it seemed to take a really long time, i.e. data. See here, I'm talking a lot about data. And so again, what it was really about was rapidly, rapidly putting out different versions, put out a new version of this page. Is it outperforming the previous one? Yes, no. Okay, well, what happens if we change the whole workflow? What happens if we do this first, do that? And next thing you know, we, we probably, over the course of about seven or eight months, probably ran 300 experiments in production where it was all focused on an outcome that was defined really high level. The team is designing the experiments, 
and we're rapidly running them and collecting data and learning from it. So that's, that's a real experience of how this works. As opposed to having a person who's been at the company for 35 years say, I know what my users want. Here it is. Here's a two-year project. Roll it out. Hey, nothing wrong with people that have been on a company for 35 years if you give them better tools to work on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the cycle. So we to run those experiments, right? We start with hypothesis, those ideations. They're not givens. You don't know what's going on. They are just ideas. They are our hypothesis. We believe that if we do that, we will see something. Now let's prove that. And we can prove that to be right or wrong. But it's right now just an hypothesis. Then we run these experiments to deliver something. And those are the ones that now are the outputs. We do something, we put it out there, let's see what happened. And the analyzing is where now we see, was that hypothesis right? Was that hypothesis wrong? And based on that, we make a decision, do we need a new hypothesis or do we need a new experiment? And we can go in this cycle on and on until we hit it, until we get the right outcome that we're looking for. Now, let me say these, these hypotheses, these experiments are small. I mean, the ones that I've worked on usually take us one to two, maybe three days to actually build the software that we needed to run the experiment. So these are very, very fast fast iterations through a lot of ideas rapidly. Yeah, in some groups, um, two to three days is a user story. <laughs> in, in two to three days, we're doing an experiment that is out in production. This is what we're talking about, right? This is the difference that we're trying to see. So how do we do that? So I'm going to talk about the technical side because so far we've talked about the business motivation and, and hopefully you're starting to see a picture of how this works. Okay, so this is about really ideating and learning from how users interact with our software. It sounds great, but there's a lot of things that have to be in place. So I'm going to talk briefly about some of the technical things. So the first thing is that, yeah, quality is kind of really important, right? <laughs> So this idea of me taking code that I'm going to write now and put it in production in just a few moments, that only works if we have a lot of things in place. And so I'm going to talk briefly about those. So I'm going to kind of geek out. Do we have any developers here? Who writes code here? Ah, oh, good, good, good. So I'm going to talk to you guys for a little while, but I want to talk to all of you. So I want all of you to listen. So there were some... A lot of what we do in continuous delivery is driving risk out of the system. If I were to sit down with you and talk to you, I'd make you cry about how much risk you really have that we just kind of gloss over. We don't talk about, we hide. So I'm going to bring some of it out right now so that you can know about it. So the first thing that, that, uh, that I want to talk about is in, in uh, continuous delivery, one of the very first things we need to do is we need to get rid of these source code branches. How many of you do branching? How many of you, now keep your hands up. How many of you have had merge problems? Yep, yep. How many of you have had bugs that have went away that came back because of branches, because of merging? How many of you have had production deployments that have gone bad because something, did, uh, every one of you have raised, the developers have raised your hand and I knew it, okay? Because uh, you know, I've been a developer for, for a number of years, and I've just seen it again and again and again. So the, the fact is, is that branching is high risk. We know that. But we do that in order to uh, manage the way that we release software. So in continuous delivery, we can't afford to have that level of risk. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to eliminate these branches. And by the way, some of the other things I'm going to talk about are kind of the gateway to being able to do that. And I know some of you are thinking, but, but, but Gitflow. Who was, who was thinking that? Come on. Rick, be honest. Who was thinking, but Gitflow? So who invented Gitflow? Mr. Git. Obi Fernandez is his name. He wrote the original paper. If you don't know him, he runs a Ruby on Rails development shop down in Orlando, Florida called Hash Rocket. 
Okay, Obi Fernandez wrote the original paper, and in his original paper, he said, if your branches live more than an hour or two, then you're failing. Now, do your branches live more than an hour or two? Yes, they probably, do they live more than a day or two? A week or two? Okay, so, so Obi Fernandez, Obi Fernandez had a great idea because he was all about saving himself 10, 15 minutes, which is, if I'm 45 minutes into this branch that's going to last an hour or two, and I realize that it's not working, I'll just delete it and go back to where I started over again. And that was the root of GitFlow. And yet we bastardized it. And now it's become a standard that creates more problems than it, than it solves. You know what's the problem with having those uh, branches from the product business point of view? You test something, you like it's great yeah that that's the one i want put it out now there it's not real and then when it goes in production it's like no that's not what i saw mm -hmm. so another thing that that you find in this world is that how many of you use pull requests come on raise your hands raise your hands okay how many of you do your pull requests set out there for hours have you ever seen them set out there for days mhm mm Again, what's happening in this case is we're delaying integration. So, in other words, when that's sitting out there in a pull request, nobody has that. And what that means is everybody that's working is not re working on something that's real. Okay? You're working on something that only becomes real whenever that one, two, three, eight things that are sitting out there kind of merge in with it. Again, that's high risk that we can't afford in a continuous delivery world. So... Now, there's this idea of around, well, if we're committing to master trunk-based development all of the time, how do we actually manage that? You said some of your experiments take two days, three days to write, but you're committing code an hour and a half into the first day. How do you manage that? Well, there's a lot of different ways. One of those ways is this thing called feature toggles. Who's heard of feature toggles before? Yep. Every business person, you need to raise your hand as well, or you need to learn about this, okay? A feature toggle is a way that you can, first of all, from a source code management perspective, you can gate something that's incomplete. Okay, so I have something, it's not gonna be finished until end of day tomorrow, but I don't wanna delay my integration right now, so I'm gonna go ahead and commit it, but it's, and it can go all the way to production, but it's turned off. Users cannot get to it. But there's another side to this, which I'm gonna elaborate a little bit more later, which is that it also is how your business people can control how they release software. I'm yep. gonna talk about this more later, but I'm just gonna mention it real quickly here now. Uh, usually, whenever we talk about feature toggles, it's not just on or off. Usually, you have some level of segmentation. For example, we might decide, let's segment by products. And then, as a product person, as a product owner, I can decide, let me roll out just to Ontario. Oh, and let me roll out to just 1% of the traffic in Ontario. Let me watch that for just a little while to make sure, okay, it looks good. Let me ramp it up to 25% of Ontario. It's been running there for an hour, two hours, five hours. Okay, I feel confident. Let me roll it out to the whole country. So in other words, feature toggles are also what allow us to do that. By That's called way, a canary release, by the way. Yeah, by the way, there's applications for you to do that. Makes it very easy for product people to manage this. You can see the results. You can see analysis. You can connect it, hook it up you, you behind define, Google You analysis. literally define your experiments in the tool. And, and when you make decisions that we're ready to go and pull up marketing and whoever needs to be ready, you have data behind that support you and tell you that you are good. I'm going to keep going on. So, oh. so let's talk a little bit about testing. Because you're probably wondering, well, how do you actually do all of your testing in this world if you're going so fast? Uh, let me start by saying there is no such thing as a testing phase or hardening phase in this world because it's in production already. So there is no such thing as, okay, we think we're done now. Let's, let's hand it over to a UAT. QA department or let's... let's uh, UAT. Yeah, yeah, something like that. UAT, yeah, that's right. Because it's already in production. So, 
that really means we need to fundamentally rethink the way that we actually build the software because it's build production, build production, build production. So I'm going to start by talking about something controversial. And we actually, where I'm at right now, I'm going to use some real data, by the way, from a Canadian bank here in just a little while. And I got their permission to do it. So that's going to be really exciting because you can see kind of a work in progress. And even where I am, we're debating this. So I find that end-to-end -end tests are about the worst way to possibly test anything ever. Number one, uh, if those of you who have a lot of end-to-end, -end, you have automation teams, you probably have built a lot of tests that almost never complete successfully, okay? And almost every time they fail, they're not failing because there's a bug in the system, they're failing because there's a problem with the environment, or login was down, or somebody messed with the data, or the wrong version of this service was there, or whatever, right? How can you adequately know the state of your system whenever you have such a thing that's so unreliable? You can't, okay? Secondarily, it's virtually impossible to adequately test your system using these end-to-end -end tests. You know, whenever I have just a tiny piece of logic, maybe around how you, uh, how, uh, validating a sin, okay? I might want to write 20 tests what happens if there's a null? What happens if there's spaces? What happens if there's characters? And you know, all these things. But the fact that the end-to-end -end tests are so heavyweight, require so much data, require so much integration, often between many back-end systems to get them right, we tend to shortcut all of that. Who is broken-hearted to mm -hmm. see this? <laughs> the developers are happy to see this. <laughs> so, this diagram, Hino, Chaba, have you guys seen this diagram before? This, this comes from the bank that shall be unnamed at this time. I'll name them here in a short while. So this is not something that we have just made up. This is something that we are working with a client right now. And I'm going to walk through this, but this is, how, this is our testing strategy, how we're approaching testing. First of all, watch the red. If you're, if you're colorblind, sorry. <laughs> It is this one. <laughs> the majority of our testing is, what is it, Chaba? Unit tests. That, by the way, we're working together at the same place right now, so that's why I can yell at them like this and harass them. Unit test is the vast majority of how we're testing the system. Now, let me talk real quickly about the end-to-end. -end. What we did is when we got there, they had a lot of end-to-end -end tests, and we went through this process where we... Oh, by the way, they weren't running them because of those reasons we talked about. And so we went through them one at a time and said, what is this actually testing? And we had a lot of cases where it was going through all of this code. And what it was testing was this. And so we said, okay, let's take this off. And let's take this off. And let's write a lot of tests around this. And over the process, we got rid of all of those end-to-end -end tests. Now, there still are a few. I don't want to make the, create the illusion that we're rid of all of them yet. I haven't been fully successful. I will be, though. I know. Unit tests. We came up with this other type of test we call component tests. And it's where I start up a piece of software, and everything it talks to is mocked. So it doesn't really, so if, I, if I'm building a service, for example, that's maybe talking into other back-end services, I boot it up and it talks to mocks. Uh, if I'm building a UI, if, let's say if I'm an Angular developer, I'm building a UI, I start up that UI and it talks to mocks. We've introduced contract testing. Who's heard of that? So we're doing consumer-based contract testing. So let's say he's writing a backend and I'm writing the software that's calling his backend or calling his service. I'm going to write a test that says, here's how I expect him to behave, and I'm going to hand it to him, and now he has to run it. And if he makes a change that breaks the test, he knows if he releases that, he's going to break me. And then we've introduced manual exploratory testing. I'm going to go more fast. I'm going to go faster. Sorry. We've got a lot of non-functional visual inspection. We had to teach developers to be very detailed-oriented, to look at things, to see things. Uh, accessibility, security, capacity, 
Code quality, yes, we put that here because we've got Sonar Cube in place and we actually look at it and we shut down pipelines if it doesn't get reach certain thresholds or we're in the process of doing that. Production monitoring anomaly detection. So we had a case where all the tests passed but a developer did something really stupid and it went to production and, uh, and all of a sudden uh, we almost brought down the whole public facing website because we were writing a file to disk about like 30,000 times a second, okay? But we caught it within like a, a minute, and within 30 minutes it was fixed. Uh, deployment compliance. So I'm gonna move on. Sorry, how much time do I have already? Why are you saying sorry? Just, okay. 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Before the break, yeah. So who's heard of DevOps? You've heard, of, you've heard of DevOps before? <laughs> the DevOps guy. <laughs> the DevOps guy has heard of DevOps? Right? So for me, DevOps is all about eliminating risk or driving risk out of the system. And so I want to start by saying, first of all, DevOps is absolutely not a department. Okay? Not a role. <laughs> Did you write that slide? Period. I added that. So, okay, so let's, let's talk about it. A lot of large companies, the way they get started with this is they do create a department. They bring somebody in and they put some tools in place. And that's probably an all right way to kind of get started. But that is not DevOps. That is about bringing tools in and introducing it to. DevOps is a mindset. DevOps is about empowering developers. It's about allowing your developers to own your production environments. It's about developers own the pipeline and all the changes out to production which is how you drive risk out of the system. And it's a culture. It is a culture, it's a mindset. And I'm real quickly gonna talk about deployment pipelines. By the way, who has, a, who has a pipeline here? So I bet if I went around, every pipeline here is gonna be a little bit different and that's what it's supposed to be. So I'm gonna kinda of walk through one, but I'm not saying that this is, don't take pictures of this. This is just an example for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with it, what it could be. I'm not saying, this is what your pipeline should do, okay? So. But maybe it's an improvement. Stop laughing over there, will you? But maybe it's an improvement of what you have now. So take some pictures. So pipelines are all about stages, and it's about getting the fastest feedback and the most important feedback as quickly as you can. So in our fictitious pipeline, stage one, we're running all of our unit tests, i.e., that's the majority of the tests of our system. That's how our system is tested, that's how we know it's high quality and those should run very fast. We might do some static code analysis. We might run something that we might call a smoke test. I don't know, that's up to you. And if all those tests pass, we might run another uh, stage where we run some more of those component type tests. By the way, they should be mocked because of the reason we said earlier, you need those things to pass. If they fail because somebody uh, logged in and changed some data, then guess what? You have no idea if your system's working or not because of data, not because of application, because of data. Uh, I'm just gonna pull all these ideas out of here just so that you can see. You would run security, you would run accessibility checks, you would run performance load tests, you would do all of these things and when it gets to the end, your code goes to production. How long it takes? So, well, I would say I don't know, how long do you think it should take, Artie? I don't know. 30 minutes or less? That's too long. So I've worked at places where our pipeline took six minutes. Okay, I think right now um, our pipeline's more in the 20 minutes, 25 minute time frame or so. So um, you don't want it to take very long because think about it this way. That's how long it takes you to recover if you have an issue. If it takes hours, then if you have a production issue, you can't recover from it for hours, short of rolling back or closing the feature toggle. So the feature toggle really allow us to separate out this notion of deployment from release, which is a lot of the secret sauce here. If there is one thing you want to learn, this is it. Mm -hmm. So in this new world, deployment is something that we just do all of the time because to not do it, it's much higher risk. 
To not do it, it requires us not integrating code. It, uh, it requires us holding something back, which means we have to tuck it away somewhere, which drives enormous risk into our system. By constantly integrating, constantly pulling all of the code, running all of the tests all of the time continuously, and continuously pushing these small, small little changes to production, it drives risk out of the system. Not that we don't ever have a defect, we do, but I can tell you that the teams that do this, the defects that they have are very far, are very few and far between. So deployment just becomes a technical decision. Release, on the other hand, is something that belongs to product folks. You know what happens when you combine them? You put the pressure on development, you put the pressure on quality and everything, and you put the pressure even on marketing that probably is ready to send now all the pretty things that they have prepared to promote this. By taking this approach, you reduce the risk, you take off the pressure, and then marketing is ready with the latest changes that you are doing. If during these deployments you have seen different feedback, your customers have told you, no, I don't like this, you have changed that, marketing takes the latest, works on the latest, and continuously updates whatever they need to send in order to be ready for that big release. So huge. Big? Well, at the end, it might be a little big. You have these small deployments and small tests but sometimes you might have this big release that you want to market, right? So it's not about now having the code ready and marketing ready at the same time and everybody is not sleeping for seven days, right? It is taking that with confidence and being ready. So how many of you think it sounds real geeky and this is all what Google and Amazon and those tech firms do? How many of you think that, right? They've, you've been asking them so, to raise hands all night. I can Leave tell you, well, uh, Leave them alone. I can tell you that, that you would be stunned at the number of really large financial organizations that are doing this all the time. And we're going to transition now where I'm going to start talking about a Canadian company. And uh, this is the company that, uh, that three of us that are here uh, are, are working in this group in the company right now. And they have given me permission to use it, I'm not allowed to use their logo, so I'm not going to tell you who who it is. But uh, but it is uh, the BBC, the big bank in Canada. <laughs> okay, uh, eighty thousand employees, forty billion in revenue. Their color is royal blue. <laughs> You have no Anyone idea, want to take right? a guess at who that is? <laughs> <laughs> it is RBC, yes. And, and, and I can mention that because I, I did ask ahead of time and I have permission. And so they've created this, this group within the bank uh, where their goal, what, what's their goal, Hino? Continuous deployment. That is their goal. And so... Is I've actually got some. He I've got asking. some data. I've got some data, and I want to talk a little bit about exactly what's happening there. And the reason that I'm bringing this is because a lot of you think, "Yeah, Amazon does that. We yeah, that." But but we work in an insurance company. We work in a bank. We can't possibly do that. that that's bull. Can that's you crap. do that again? That that that's that's cons that that's 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 the mindset that will cause you to go out of business. Sorry, but it is. So. So when we coaches showed up there, they were already doing some scrummy stuff, okay? So they kind of had, had worked that process out already, but we decided to put it on steroids a little bit. And so what we're gonna talk about is some of the changes that we made. So first of all, let me talk a little bit about team composition. Uh, in this group, there are no scrum masters. So Sorry, scrum masters, but uh, but we decided that, that we wanted to go with a much lighter weight approach. There are no QA on any of these teams. Okay, so the, the, the teams are comprised of developers, uh, product owners, and we have uh, user experience, UX, uh, 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 both designers and, and user experience people who kind of float between the teams a little bit. 
there are some BAs on some of the teams, largely because we're still interfacing with these really complex legacy backend systems in many cases, so we have BAs that are there. But uh, we decided to go with a really kind of lightweight approach. We also decided right away that we wanted to start to visualize all of the things that are, that are really important for the teams. So we started creating the, uh, access so that everybody could see the tests that are running, the unit tests and such, that we started running quality reports and things like sonar, the static code analysis, uh, PMD, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to bore you with all of those. And making them public. What a great way to change behavior whenever, you're, whenever people can actually see what we're doing. Uh, we started trying to make the quality of the code that we're writing public. So developers that maybe kind of felt, okay, ah, it's, it's messy, it's sloppy. Now all of a sudden, their product owner knows how to look and see. The other thing that we did is we decided that we wanted to focus on very, very outcome-based metrics. Who's heard of DORA? So, uh, so these are the set of metrics that our organization now is running on. And I just want to mention these real quickly. There's one additional. This last one here is not DORA, but the first five are. So let me tell you what they are. The first metric that we're measuring teams on are deployment frequency. This is how frequently do you deploy to production. So teams are working on this metric, okay? So if you're deploying to production every two weeks, part of your goal was to increase that frequency. By the way, not velocity. We don't, nobody tracks velocity. Teams might, it's up to them if they want to or not. Actually, more and more of our teams aren't actually using Scrum. I'll get to that in a moment. So, um, Lead time for change. And the way we're measuring that is from the time a developer commits code into Git, how long is it before that code is actually in production? Okay? Time to restore service. So if we do have an outage of some sort or some sort of problem, how long does it take us to recover from that problem? Change failure rate. How many what percentage of the time that we make a change does it result in a defect or some issue? And that includes, not production, that also includes our pipeline. So those of you who let your pipeline set red for days, you're going to fail this metric. You got to keep that pipeline running. Uh, the final DORA metric is availability, and that's of your production system. How available is your production system? So right now, we track one additional metric on the team's which is escaped defects. How many defects made it to production? I can tell you it's very low. So, but there's 15, is it 15 teams across this group? I think it's 15 teams. The 16th team starts next week, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not a large group. And how many defects do they have? I don't know. I, I, I didn't pull that data. Okay. Uh, so she asked how many defects. I'm going to guess across 15 teams. It's pr it, in production right now. I'm going to guess maybe a dozen, maybe. I did pull this number before I, before I gave a talk in um, India a few months ago. And at that time, I was working with four teams, and the number of defects that we had was two. Now, the DORA metrics are great. We have started to build a dashboard there where we're pulling actual data off of our workflow. So it's not something that we actually have to report on, but the things that we do kind of feed these. And the next couple of slides actually come from this group. So this is not something that's made up. This is me yesterday capturing some screenshots from our dashboards. So this is, this is a Canadian bank, by the way. This is RBC that we're talking about. This is our number of deployments. It's by day. So you can see we're anywhere from two, four, up to it looks like 11 or so deployments a day. By the way, this is just for one group, one product team, which is four teams within that 15 team group. 
This next slide is also for those four teams, that, that same group. So average lead time for the last seven releases that they've had, what was the time from the time code was committed until it ended up in production? 1.7 days. It is, Chad. Yep. How many production deployments are we doing per day? Over the last month, it's three, and that's up from two the previous month. Now, to give you a perspective, we're just starting. That group that I showed you, that should be about 80 a day, okay? This is a big bank. We're going through a lot of change. We're going through, you know, a lot of making people around comfortable with a lot of these new ideas and new practices. But the truth is, you can do this. If, a, if the big royal blue guys can do this, you can do this. You should do this. Because, you see, the reason we're doing this at the bank is not because we like tech. I do. I love tech. Okay? But that's not the reason why the bank is investing in this. The bank is investing in this because they wanted it to deliver world-class products. They're investing in this because they want to get closer to their customers. They're investing in this because they know the rate of change is only going to accelerate. It's not going to slow down. And they need to be able to adapt. We can no longer take a year to change the navigation, only to find out that our users don't even care. Instead, we need to rapidly learn and grow. This is your slide. Oh, finally. <laughs> well, you can show them all, right? It is all the things that we're talking about. Let's not make it dramatic. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands or anything. But, um, <laughs> but this is the goal, right? You start with that thinking. You start with the intent. You start with the outcome that you're looking for. And then deliver continuously to learn. So those deployments, those continuous deployments and the small releases, the small ones make changes, make adjustments, pivot, change, whatever it's needed. And then learning from customers in order to achieve the big one, right? The big things. Um, sometimes we say that, oh, we have projects that are going to last two years. You are looking for too much and you don't know how you're going to get there. Maybe it's going to take you two years, maybe it's going to take you less. But don't wait two years to make a deployment in production, right? Make those small deployments continuously small. Try to find ways to how to break. Am I on the right spot? So wrong spot. Try to find ways to break the value that you start delivering slowly, slowly, small and small in pieces. Control it with the feature toggles that we said, right? Try it with some testers and then with some more. And then add that add functionality and add users as you go. So that two year, it all of a sudden it becomes a continuous delivery way of seeing the value, of getting the customers. So at the end of the two years, it's not a guess anymore. It's not that big risk that you're holding on your back. It's not, oh my God, let's stay now up to see what's going on. You are confident. You know it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Whatever marketing has to sell out there, they know it's going to be, it's going to bring the outcomes that you are looking for. I thought of something other, something else I want to just mention real I quickly. I always make you think. Stop. Uh, you, you do make me think. <laughs> So uh, we're, we're going to go to a break here in just a second. So this bank, tonight, uh, one of their products is going to open up to 2 million users. Do you how know how much deployment and how much the, the, the technical staff have to do for this to happen? Nothing. Nothing. What's going to happen is that, it's probably already happened, is that a product owner is going to open up a dashboard and they're going to drag a little slider. And it's going to open something up to that's been out there for about uh, a couple of weeks now with 80,000 users. Okay? And this is a core banking thing. There's millions of dollars running through this. So this is, this is, so we're not talking about 
small things. Okay? Not changing so, the colors of the buttons. That's right. We're not talking about changing the color of a button. That's right. So, okay, so here's what's going to happen. We're going to take a break now, okay? But we're going to run a lean coffee after break, okay? And we want to stay on this topic of continuous delivery, okay? And so what we're going to ask you to do is during the break, we have Sharpies and we have Post-it notes up here. Ardita and I are going to stay up in the front. Please, if there's a topic you want to talk, a question you have, some input you want to have, if you want to talk about anything related to continuous delivery, write it on a postie. We're going to be collecting them during the, the break, and we're going to kind of coordinate them and organize them up here. We'll probably do a real quick, a, a dot vote's going to be too chaotic, so we'll do a vote by a kind of show of hands afterwards, and we're going to get all of us involved in a, in a larger discussion about this. If you want to know a little bit more about the client that we're talking about, Kino, Chaba, why don't you guys stand up real quickly? These are the other two people that are, the three of us are working in this group. And so I know uh, a lot of you think maybe banks can't do this. So talk to these guys. They're the brains behind it. I'm just a good looking one. So, <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we're, we're on, how long is the break? So we're on a 15 minute break. Please come up and write some topics down and we're gonna collect them. And thank you, we'll be back in 15.
come back real quickly. I did get another beer over the break. Yeah, yeah you have time. To, you still have time. Uh, if I drink one more beer, you might be lucky enough to hear me practice some of my yodeling. I just want you to know uh, it, it's uh, it's happened before. You don't want to do that. Stop. No, no, don't challenge him on that. Do not challenge him. So, so real quickly, there were there were there were two questions about what we talked about that I just want to throw out here real quickly. Somebody asked, "What is Dora?" So, so Dora stands for DevOps Research and Analytics. It is a group that have done years of studies. They've interviewed tens of thousands of companies. Uh, they've created a database. They wrote a book about their research. It's called Accelerate. You can look up the book. And last year, Google kind of acquired them. So it's part of Google Cloud now. So that's, that's what it is. And one other person asked another question, which is something I wasn't clear about, and I intended to mention when we had the slide. So somebody said, you said that they kind of started scrum -y. Are they really doing Scrum? The truth is, is that where we are right now, we don't tell them what methodology to follow. We say we're going to measure these outcomes. We're measuring those DORA metrics. Whatever methodology you want to use to improve is up to you. So we're not going around and saying, oh, you're doing stand-ups, check. You have uh, retrospectives, check. We're not doing that. But what we're saying is that those metrics, how do you improve them? And so I can tell you that what we have seen is a steady movement away from Scrum and more toward a Kanban approach. And we've seen a lot of teams start to shed more and more of the ceremony and get more and more focused on very, very fast iterations and, and fast cycle times, tightening uh, down the, uh, the whip limits and such. Okay. So we have a lot of post-its here on the wall. We so should probably... So one thing, don't buy stickies at Dollar Store. That's right. <laughs> I'm going to show you guys one other thing as well. I don't know. They're falling. The light yellow, yes. That's what the Jeff, Jeff bought those. So, so some of you clearly have not mastered your post-it note uh, <laughs> skills yet. So I'm going to help everybody here with this right now. So I'm going to show you bad, then I'm going to show you good. Um, we'll, okay, so watch, watch, watch very closely. This is highly technical, okay? So watch very, very closely. This, bad, bad. See the curl? See the curl? When I stick it on the wall, look at what happens. Now watch this. Watch very closely. Good. Good. Okay? Because that will stay on the wall much longer. Magic tricks. <laughs> Magic tricks. So how do we want to start? So, so here it is. How about... Um, can we group them and then let's do a vote real quickly. Let's... let's can we kind of group them together into some categories? The voting is going to be hard. So here's what I'm looking. I'm sensing some ideas. It is about how to start, how to convince business, how to move from continuous deployment to continuous delivery. It's about a little bit on how to start. There are some others into, well, what about... Uh, See? Huh? <laughs> scope creep. They're falling down. Scope. There is no scope in Agile. What, what do you mean scope They're falling. The, that doesn't the, exist. The stickies are falling. Um, there is another group here that is about, well, what does, how does this testing work like this? So where is UAT? Where is the sandboxes? All of these. So it's okay. around testing. Okay. There is also some questions around. See which one fell? <laughs> I don't make this stuff up, people. <laughs> are we playing 99 bottles now? <laughs> Um, Only four. <laughs> and there is now another group that is about these concepts, but not web. But mm -hmm. it's like for software that is delivered, like mobile apps or software that is delivered mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. package, right? Okay. So how do you do continuous delivery on those? Okay. And then um, how about we start with, while you talk, where to start? Mm -hmm. You start with that, and I'm going to group. Okay. So, so... 
for those of you who are, are, are at the very beginning, maybe you're more in a much longer release cycle, let's say, okay? Uh, the first thing, the thing that takes the longest in all, well, there's two things that take the longest. Uh, one of the things that takes the longest is learning how to write quality code. Okay, and this sounds like it shouldn't take a long time, it sounds, but uh, believe it or not, learning for developers, learning how to write tests, learning how to deliver quality code takes a while. So how can we get started? We don't have to start releasing rapidly. We can start working on, you know, releasing code or getting much better at this. If you live in a world where people say, oh, bugs are a fact of life, you need to stop that, okay? Uh, if, you have a, if you've had to go out and spend a lot of money to buy a software to keep track of the number of bugs that you have so that you can keep them, uninstall that software because you don't need it. There is no need for a bug tracking software. What you have to do is you have to stop producing bugs. Now, that's easy to say, not as easy to do. And so what I would do if I were you to get one of the th things that you can do to get started is to start to shift away from building a lot of stuff and hopelessly trying to test it at the end and instead move to a process where we start to test it in small little increments at the same time that we're building it. And that implies that your developers are doing it because it can't work if you have another group doing it. I see your hand, Jeff. Give me one second and I'll be right there. Do you know of any industry in the world where we have somebody do the work and then they kind of walk away and somebody else makes sure that they did it right? It really doesn't exist, does it? Imagine if you took your car to a mechanic and he got under the hood, he did some stuff, he slammed it and walked away. And you say, aren't you going to turn it on to make sure? No, someone else will come out. They'll, they'll, they'll figure it out if I did it right. Well, that's a lot of what we've done in our software industry. So if you're in a leadership role, you're mostly guilty of this. Uh, it's not a developer problem because you see the developers have molded perfectly to the system that we've created. The problem is, is that you hold everybody accountable for dates. And they're unrealistic dates and often dates that somebody pulled out of thin air. And, and so you've got to move away from that. Okay, you've got to say that the most important thing is quality. So uh, how else to get started? We've got to start to deliver in much, much smaller batches. So I have heard again and again, well, my users won't take a lot of releases. A release is a really big thing. And yeah, that's because you're doing it wrong. You're building up six months worth of changes and pushing it out, and that's jarring. Because what they had yesterday and what they have today is dramatically different. And that's what users can't take. But if in that six months, you rolled out 70 releases, those releases are so small that you probably don't need anything akin to change management to help you roll with it. Those changes are tiny. Those changes are easy to adapt. Whenever you go to Amazon, before you leave, they probably deployed 100 times underneath of you and you didn't even know it. These are what we're talking about. So find ways to release software in much, much smaller batches. You know, I don't need to roll out some huge workflow in order to see value. Maybe I, yes, Jeff first. Thank you. Thanks, Jeezy. Just wondering if you can maybe talk about the idea of how you do this when you're dealing with a legacy code base that is riddled with technical debt. <laughs> ha ha. I'll talk to you later, Jeff. <laughs> Control A, delete. Hi. So there's, there's a lot of ways to, to, to address it. I'll, I'll mention a couple. Uh, uh, and then... Um, one that you might be a little bit familiar with, and I'll also talk about uh, something at the bank that we're dealing with right now, and then I'll talk about the worst case scenario, okay? So, Jeff, you probably know that I did some work at Capital One a long time ago. <laughs> so, uh, if, you, if you don't know, I, I, I helped lead the, the US Capital One's uh, continuous deployment drive, and the very first project that I worked on there was a large legacy customer servicing app. 
and they needed to move it, and they wanted they they had to move it to like a new platform, and that's what they kind of decided. It was about 22 teams, so it was a large implementation, and so what we what they did in that case is we created a strangular pattern. So we didn't try to fix the legacy. Instead, what we did was we uh, we learned how to run the two systems parallel so that you could move from one to the other. And we slowly re replaced the old system one one deployment at a time with, with a new system. So that was the very first software. We've got something a little bit similar to that at the bank that I'm working at right now, and that there's a legacy system. In fact, the one that I said that we're rolling two million more users on tonight, that's the system. And so it is a very, very, very old system. I'm gonna get a little bit technical here. We can't change anything about it. And there was no way for us to do a nice, clean strangler pattern there, i.e. replace components because that system is very, very, very tightly coupled, okay? And that, so if you know what that means. So what we were able to do though is we were able to request that they in insert one JavaScript file in their header. That's all. And so that was enough for us to create a hook. So what we do now is we have feature toggles that reside inside of that JavaScript file that make decisions around, is this user on the new or on the old? And if they're on the new, our JavaScript is going through that page that's rendered and rewriting URLs. Rewriting the actual URLs that the links take you to. So that whenever they click to go view some financial stuff, if the toggle is on, that, reg that takes them to the new system. If the toggle is off, they still continue to stay into the new system. So again, it's kind of a strangular pattern, but it's in using a little bit clever technology piece. So okay. now should, I'm going to talk time, about Should worst we time case. box your answers because we have more questions? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Cheesy. Yeah. Um, not so much a question, maybe advice. Uh, I used to work in a parallel program where, where to what Cheesy showed about today. Mm -hmm. um, just advice or something that I saw that helped um, to get to for the starting to answer the starting question. To get to uh, continuous delivery, first you'll have to let them go through the regular failures of delivery. Uh, and then, w as you bring in improvements, what helps is continuous delivery becomes a high that business gets on to say, oh, I can release more often, how? Uh, we'll say, well, make it smaller. Mm -hmm. And I want to release more often, what, how? We'll make it even smaller. And it becomes a high that they get on to say, well, we did eight deployments this year, which is unheard of in the bank's history. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we come to this point, which, which is amazing, which is unheard of probably in the industry. <laughs> Just. It's unheard of in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> so let me let me just uh, clamp onto that in the industry. So Canada's way behind in this space, okay? If you go to Europe, this is actually pretty common. If you go to the US, it's far, far, far more common than it is in Canada. And, and there's, I'm not gonna try to speculate or go into why, but let me just tell you that, that a large percentage of the banks in Europe and quite a few of the large banks in U.S. are doing this already. They've been doing it for a while now. So, so it's just, uh, so I don't want to create the illusion that, oh, this is, this is like brand new, but that this, this, is, this is something that companies who, are, who want to compete and companies who want to strive to deliver world-class products, they're, they're pushing to get to this place. So, Artie, so what did you come up with? I'm going to bring the next topic. There is a couple of, uh, there, are, there are more than a couple, but it seems like there is still not a clear way of these environments of how the testing goes. Environment, so. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 wait, wait. I know you know the answer. <laughs> Let's hear the questions. <laughs> sure. So, it's a question. You see what I have to live with every day? <laughs> Wait a second. So it's about sandboxes. It's about UAT between deployment and release. It's about transition from a release environment to a continuous delivery. 
It's about security testing. So can you explain to, to us how, how many environments are here? So where you want to get to is where you have no environments. That, that's the ultimate goal. So we're not there yet in the bank that I'm working at. But how many of you have environment problems? Those of you who didn't raise your hands, you're lying. <laughs> no, I'm joking. The, the, the problem is, is that we have done, a, in organizations, we've done a really bad job of managing our environments. We have these things that are called snowflakes, which means everyone is different. You know, every environment is different. You're never sure, whenever you put some code in there, what's going to actually happen. And that's risk, right? And so one of the ideas that exists in DevOps is that we need to take that risk out of the system. The way you take that out of the system is that you have code, script, whatever it is, that builds an environment. That code is checked into source code management. It's managed, it's versioned, and that is the definition. So there is no such thing as a QA or a UAT or a UBT or a whatever environment. There is just this code. If I need some place to run some type of test, I take this code, I build that quickly, I run my test, and I tear it down. By the way, that's how your production environment is made as well. And so there's this idea that we don't want, have you ever heard we want cows and not pets? Have you heard that t before? Pets, everyone has a name, you know, every pet has a name, everyone's a little bit different, they have their own personalities. In software delivery, that is risk. So the idea is, is that going down this pipeline, let's say if I want to make a change to my production environment, I start by making a change to that script. It gets checked in, and that starts the pipeline. And just like changes to the code go down that pipeline, changes to an environment go down. And the team has to feel confident that the battery of tests and the quality checks that they have down that pipeline are enough so that I feel confident that by the end, it's ready to go. So let me just create a little bit of a concrete. Let's say if, uh, let's say I want to add some cash to some, I want to add more cash to some process that's running or whatever it is. I will make that change. And that change will travel down these steps, the security, the performance, the all of these different uh, steps and these quality checks happen with that. And if it gets to the end, then it goes to production. So that's why whenever I said, you know, we need to disseminate DevOps out to the teams, the teams have to own those pipelines. Because if we're going to hold the teams accountable for the quality, then they have to define what those stages are. They have to define how does this, how do all of the, what, what do we as a team need to do to be confident that whenever I make a change that it's safer to go all the way out. Not some guy in a centralized team who uh, I've never talked to and who doesn't know anything about my application that yeah. dictates. I what need about to the security? Special. How do you test security? So security is the same way as, as anything else. So there, there are a few things that you can do. Um, so most of which is baked in the pipeline, but there is no, no replacement for education for our developers. So every organization hopefully is putting your developers through training around what it takes to make write secure code, code that's not as easy to break in. Uh, now, as your code is going down the pipeline, it is very easy to wire both static and, secure and dynamic security testing into your pipeline. So in other words, it can do code scans, and it can quickly give you feedback back if, uh, if uh, there's an issue there. That's called static security testing. Dynamic security testing is where your code gets deployed into an environment, and there's a software that knows a lot of the vulnerabilities that exist, and it can go out and try to, to break your system. So where we are right now, we have those running in the pipeline. Uh, our teams are also required, uh, uh, Chaba, is it quarterly that we do a pen test? Or, or? So there, there is some interval. I, do, I don't know what, what the interval is. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but that, that there are three out external companies 
that, that, that the bank has hired, and so I believe it's quarterly, but I, I, I won't swear to it, where literally, and, and we have to rotate through the teams, yes. So, okay, so outside of that interval, then, and uh, Chavo was just saying that if there's like a really big change, then you have to do this as well, in addition to that. And you don't use the same company every time. They're rotating through these three companies to come in and, and do this penetration testing. So, so what's in essence happening is that our security tests, not the penetration testing, but the other tests are running multiple times a day. So there's a lot of emphasis on this, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to make the next one around business. Good. Now you, meanwhile, think about all of this in software and mobile apps. Ah, okay. Think about it. Okay. So That's the, easy. The ones that uh, I'm going to touch here is how to convince business groups to give up control over of features. And then there is another one that says who controls the, the feature toggling. That is a way to give to um, to business a, a visibility and give up the control. You say, here it is what you have. There it is, the changes that the teams are making, and here it is where you can control. You have that feature toggling in your hand. You make the decision to turn it on or off. You make the decision how many customers you want to see. And, and they have their part on it. They can bring that business thinking into it. But it is now in the hands of the teams to see, to deploy, and to have the control on the technical side. The, the control that you're looking for, to, that business doesn't give up, is because they want to reduce the risk. They want to reduce insecurities. They want to reduce all the things that they don't know what developers are hiding. And it is really, it, it is like, my, my job is on the line, my salary, my kids, a uh, house to have a, a home is in line. I'm going to do everything is possible, everything I can to make sure that this is well done. And if I don't know what's going on because I'm on the business and someone has the code behind and I have no visibility, I'm going to start being probably paranoid and I'm going to do things that are not the right things to do. So developers need to give visibility and need to give also a sense of control to say it is in your hands what to do. This is how we create collaboration. This is how we create the transparency. It's not about hiding. Okay, you tell me what you want. Give me two, three days, and I'll come back to you. No, we do this together. So, so, and just to expand that a little bit further, you, you've probably has everyone here heard of A/B testing? Have you, have you heard of that? Yeah. Feature toggling is what gives us that ability. So think about it. That I've got a version of this this uh, page out there. And I decide I want a second version. So I put that behind another feature toggle, and it's out in production. And the product owner might decide, you know, let me send 5% of the traffic to the second version. Let me send half to the second and half to the first. And that works if we have, before we've gone out, we've defined what the experiment is. We know before we've deployed what data we're going to look at and what we will consider success. Okay, and then we are able to collect the data to help us do that. And we might decide, you know, B is looking better. Let me shut down A, but let me create now another version of A, of B. And that's part of how you ideate and part of how you experiment very rapidly with those feature toggles. Yeah. Yeah. So in mobile, it works the same. So the challenge with mobile is that we have this buffer called the app stores, right? So we can't push code many times a day. But it's pretty common in mobile now to push code at least every two weeks to push a new version. Some apps now are pushing new versions every week. And trust me, I bet a lot of those apps that are getting pushed every two weeks or every week have feature toggles behind them. I know they are because I was like seven, eight years, six, six or seven years ago, we were pushing mobile apps with feature toggles. So I know that they're there. And what they can do is they can remote turn them on whenever things occur. So there were cases where, uh, this was a number of years ago, where we were able to build things in the mobile app, but the back end wasn't quite ready. We went on ahead and pushed it. 
and we turned it on later whenever the back end was ready. Uh, we've had mobile cases where we'll go out with multiple experiences, multiple where we're trialing things in mobile. So it's no difference. They, the only difference is that instead of deploying to users every day, you've got a little bit of a buffer that is now every week or every two weeks or so to put them out. So your experiments tend to be a little bit larger, you know, or you can push multiple experiments at the same time. Yeah, uh, at the same, my experience has been that um, you create these beta uh, versions of your app with a limited number of users that you have as beta users, so under agreement, and then you test through that. So you make some updates through this test app before you push all the changes to the real app. That's another way of um, managing users. Okay, I'm gonna take the other question. Um, it is topic. It is around the roles. So pizza, cinnamon, um, cinnamon. Um, it is, for example, um, when you said that we don't have Scrum Masters, there are some questions around that. Uh -huh. So how do diff how do um, you how did you ex you didn't explain that the team what the team knows how to build without the Scrum Master tearing them, telling them, sorry, I'm trying to understand. Um, how, without having a scrum master, who is um, facilitating and coordinating the agile team? So some questions around the scrum master. Okay. Then, then there are some questions around UX. So how did UX work ahead and together? Uh. And then there is some questions around developers. So how did you teach developers to do this testing? pieces and uh, mm -hmm. train them to in this new world. So it's around the roles here. Okay, well let's start with the Scrum Master role real quickly first. So um, as you deliver more rapidly, a lot of the traditional Scrum ceremonies and activities become less meaningful. For example, if we're constantly releasing and reflecting on data and making our next decision, this whole idea of release planning doesn't matter as much. If we're you know, constantly releasing things throughout, even the boundaries of a sprint tend to have less meaning, okay? And if we're not planning far out in advance, you know, i.e. we're reacting to data and looking at a few days worth of work at a time, this idea of grooming is not as important and we really kind of do it on the spot just in time via just quick collaborations and such. And so what tends to happen is a lot of, of the things that, that, that we traditionally would say are part of Scrum become not important or they kind of fall away in this world. And so there still are, we still have this need to pause and reflect, you know, retrospectives. We still come together every morning to have our stand-ups and those sort of things. By the way, I'm not saying that those are the only thing that the Scrum Master says. I'm going to address the rest in just a moment, so bear with me. But as far as the, the facilitation aspect that, that, that is part of, part of a Scrum Master's role, that becomes a very tiny thing. And so what we're doing where we are now is we're rotating that through the developers. Developers are just taking turn. Okay, for this week, I'll do it. And it's kind of an interesting thing because a lot of developers are kind of introverted or they're not as used to, you know, taking some of those roles. And by rotating it through the teams, it's actually helping th some of the developers uh, develop some of those other skills as well. Now, there always is also another role that, that or another responsibility as part of the Scrum Master, which is to kind of guide the team, if you will, and to help them kind of mature, you know, and, and, and in, in, the, in the ways of Scrum, okay? And so, well, I see your hand. Give me one second. I'll come right to you, okay? So, we, uh, we don't, so uh, th there is some of that, that, that that's there. So, we've got three coaches who are kind of helping mature the teams. But what we're finding is more and more of our teams, yes, four, four. There's another guy who's not here who's also with us. Um, they're not really following Scrum, and, you know, and so they, they've kind of gone much, much to a much more lighter approach. Um, we have tech leads 
who have stepped up and are kind of doing mentorship within the teams themselves as well. And so the having this official role just that there didn't seem to be, it seemed like it was an overhead. And I want to come to you as a question. I saw another hand over here as well. You had a question or, or a comment. Um, I don't need a microphone either, but. <laughs> um, so another part of the Scrum Master job is all obviously to deal with organizational impediments. And how did you structure that within the team and who was dealing with it? So the, so the way that we have structured that is, uh, so, we have these kind of product groups. We're calling them journeys, okay? And there is an organization that is over the product. So for example, there'll be what we call a journey leader, which might be akin to a product manager who's at, at that level. Then we have a technical person, uh, a tech lead, who's also at that journey level. And then as you go down to the individual teams, there are tech leads on the individual teams and product owners. And so what happens is, is we have these kind of daily get-togethers in the journeys where there's multiple teams, which we have one now that's adding a fifth team, which is the largest one. So they have these daily kind of huddles where they come back together and they talk about specifically about what impediments do we have, what's going on, and it's the developers who fill that role. So if the teams can't resolve it, it gets escalated to, if it's on the business side, it gets escalated to the journey owner, if it's technical in nature, it gets escalated to the uh, to the technical person who's at the journey level. So that's how we're handling those right now. Chaba has something to say. I just want to add one more. We also have something called navigator. Yeah. Oh, yes. Navigators. Very good. And navigators are those uh, who are interfacing with the other part of the bank. Yes. So we, so so uh, it, these guys who've been working in the bank for some of them for 10, 10, 15, 20 years, and they know who they have to talk to in order to to solve certain impediments mm -hmm. or certain problems. So How we use those guys. What's their yeah. salary? They're, they're not associated, by the way, they're not associated with the team per se. They are associated with the journey. So what is their so job description and their salary? And are you hiring? <laughs> <laughs> so did I see another hand over here related? Yes, OK. Yeah, uh, this is uh, probably uh, a lot of people have seen this uh, mm -hmm. scenario. A lot of times there is a team management which says like, you know, this is what the team wants to be done. And mm -hmm. there are some impediments around that. Mm -hmm. And then again, when we say, okay, these are the issues with the team, then it's like, it comes back again to the team. It's like a ping pong, you know, you raise the issues and they say, okay, let the team decide. But you know, there is no middle, way, middle solution for any of these things. Mm -hmm. How do you solve these? That's an organizational problem. <laughs> yeah, that's not a continuous delivery problem. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, by the way, every place where we go, there's organizational problems, okay? So the, 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 there's not a magic bullet to solve a lot of those. So uh, I can tell you that, that the majority of the time whenever I go in to work with a group on continuous delivery or continuous deployment, they, they always believe that, that it's a technical challenge. And almost 100% of the time, it's a management problem. Mm -hmm. Even at this bank, it's a management issue. So, okay, so because, because the teams given the, the space, we'll learn this and we'll thrive in this space. So, so addressing that requires a, it's, um, a set of skills. For so sure. um, in every organization, the weakest link is leadership, mm -hmm. it, period, right? If you want to do something right and you don't have the right leadership support, that's your weakest link. That's where it's going to break. That's where you're going to decide if, if this is successful or not. And um, in this group, they can do what they're doing because they have that leadership support. The leadership doesn't come back to them. The leadership says, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. What do you want me to remove from you? So instead of a scrum master doing the ping pong, is the mm -hmm. leaders actually that do that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because they don't understand so like it. Loop, yeah. Like so the question that they need to ask is, how can I help you? Not what will you do? It, it's a very different way of thinking. It is coming from a mm -hmm. management perspective where the management stays on top of the pyramid mm -hmm. and the teams are down. Uh, Flip it backwards and make it a supporting structure where the leadership is at the bottom and the teams are up, the teams lead. Trish, this sounds like a fantastic topic maybe for us to go into more depth Yes, we on are, an entirely we are separate uh, Agile TO meetup. Because I suspect uh, there's a lot to dig into here. Fantastic question. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we are running out of time. Uh, let, 
Should I real quickly just like in two minutes go through each of no, the other No, two minutes roles? is too long. 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you teach developers to uh, do the quality? The first thing you do is you tell them that that's, your, that's their new priority. Uh, and that will be shocking to them because they have never heard that before. They've always been told, when's it going to be done? Why aren't you done yet? What's the date? So you need to tell them that the primary objective is quality, okay? And, and then you need to tell them that 100 times more because they won't believe you because most likely you're lying to them. It's not going to be that. So then once you say that, you need to give them the space to learn. That's, that's my... 15 second answer. How about uh, the UX? UX, UX, the 15 second answer is that you do not need to make pixel perfect uh, wireframes the vast majority of the time, okay? Because developers don't need it. That's not what they need. And if you're spending all of your time going to stakeholders to show them these, here's what we're doing for the next year, you're not at continuous delivery. Instead, get with the team, <laughs> rapidly iterate, Often just drawing something on the whiteboard is enough to get the idea going. Maybe at, at the very final step, they might need something that's a little bit more refined, but the majority of the work you don't. Read, lean UX. Iterate, low fidelity, high fidelity at the very last moment. So there are some questions here that I think we need to take them on like one to one. Is about like, why are there so many songs about rainbows? And how long is a piece of string? I think we need a different, and I have the feeling Jeff wrote this. Jeff. Those are good questions. I, <laughs> I have no doubt. So I think let's take those over a beer because they are more <laughs> philosophical <laughs> questions. Um, and there is also some questions around the tools and legacy, but we probably touched them. Are we out of time? Maybe Chris? that's it for now. We can talk after. Two minutes left. Okay, so may maybe uh, do you tools have a closing, quickly, just closing tools st or closing statement. Sure, closing statement. I don't know. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. no, that was it. So start with business. Business needs to be the one that leads this. Don't make it a technical thing. Make it a business need. If business wants this, you need to help us with this. You need to help us creating these environments, creating this learning, creating these structures, and thinking small from the beginning don't come to us with big things come to us with hypotheses not with roadmaps mm -hmm. mm -hmm. do you know what the agile manifesto who's heard of the agile manifesto <laughs> which one do you know that the agile manifesto tells us what our highest priority should be do you know that so the very first principle of the so agile manifesto for software development I'm going to quote it, it says, our highest priority, that's how it starts. That's how I know it's the highest priority. Our highest priority is to deliver value. Continuously deliver. Is to continuously deliver valuable, oh, I'm, I'm now screwing it up. You're drunk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to our customers. Our highest priority is to continuously deliver valuable software our customers. For our customer. So yes. the fact is is that this this for their competitive advantage. advantage. There yes. you go. Somebody has a phone that can read. <laughs> 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 so th this this is attainable, by the way. It's not something that you should be afraid of. It's something we should all be talking about because if you think about it, this is the realization of Agile. This is where Agile's taking us, okay? And so I would challenge all of you to learn about this, to experiment in this space, and to try to move toward this. And thank you very, very much. We've had a great time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, guys. That was completely excellent. I uh, want to thank Wrangle again. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to... Uh, well, here you are. I'll take it. Yeah. Don't tell him. They're, Thank you. It looks like just one <laughs> gift, but there are actually two inside Ooh. there, so you guys can fight over who gets what later. He doesn't or see now. it. He left. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I think you've probably all heard that uh, we have an after event at Kelly's Landing, which is at the corner of York and Front. So if you go out of this building and hang a left and go up York Street, you'll see it again on your left. And uh, hopefully a few people will show up there and uh, we'll continue some of these conversations. I don't know if we'll be able to determine the length of a piece of string, but we'll give it a shot. And uh, I'd like to thank Trish for emceeing tonight. A round of applause, please. I'd like to thank Elaine for uh, running the AV. John for managing our Twitter feed as we went along. And all of you for coming out, really appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to seeing you at Agile Drinks in December and uh, another of these events in January. Thanks very much. And lastly, if um, we don't see you between now and next year, have a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year. And yeah. to your health. <laughs>